In this tutorial, we will cover the standard composite ply-based modeling workflow. This will review all the basic entities and steps involved in defining a typical composite model in HyperMesh. Uh, we'll be using this hat geometry, a typical starting point for these types of uh, composite model builds is simply a meshed geometry, which is what our starting point database has. We'll build a representative laminate of typical unidirectional carbon fiber and fiberglass plies. Unit system we're working with in this example is millimeters, newton seconds. And while this process is presented using OptiStruct as a solver, I do want to emphasize that the same material can be used for any of the other standard supported solvers. So Radios, Nastran, Abacus, Dyna, and ANSYS can all follow this tutorial directly. For any small changes from solver to solver regarding cards, uh, we can look at the solver specific section and that will list those changes. So you can go over there and just find the specific solver you are using. Again though, the process for our purposes is 99% the same. To begin, I'm going to go ahead and open a session of HyperMesh. I already have one open. And our starting point model will be under File, Open, HyperMesh Model. And I'm going to use this hat geometry. As I mentioned previously, starting point for this tutorial is just some simple meshed geometry. I do have some loads and a simple subcase defined in this database already. A couple materials which we'll review later, but nothing else. So all the composite data for a typical model will be, be defined in this tutorial. Most of the composite data in HyperMesh is managed via the uh, composite browser, which can be accessed via the model ribbon and composite browser selection right here. And this provides a simple filter for all the standard composite entities, as well as composite specific tools, mainly accessed through this right-click context menu. And with that, we'll go ahead and get started. The first composite entity we'll create is a template property. OptiStruct and Radio support ply-based modeling curves directly. And in these solvers, the template property is uh, essentially a placeholder which instructs the solver to look at any laminate and ply cards for composite data. The template property does also specify non-composite data typically seen on property cards. So in the case of OptiStruct, some examples of this would be offset or Z0 and non-structural mass. In other solvers, the template property is always the typical solver property card used for composite zone modeling. Some examples of this would be Nastran, uh, using a PCOM G, or Abacus using a shell section, and so forth. You can refer to the solver specific section for the correct card to use, uh, depending on your solver, and do also note that the composite browser does create the correct default card uh, upon property creation. In these zone-based solvers, the template property serves as a template for the final property cards to be generated. Uh, what this means for us is that any attributes like offset that should appear on the final property card should be defined on the template property. And at the end of the composite model build, the final properties are populated using the ply base data, which specifies the layers on each property card, and the template property, which specifies any other solver specific attributes. To create these in HyperMesh under the composite browser, I'll do a right click create property. You'll notice in the case of OptiStruct, I get the correct default card image. And I will assign this to my component. The next item we'll specify is the offset. This is still a solver specific attribute. So you can refer to the a uh, proper location to set these in the solver specific section. Uh, but for most of our common solvers, this appears on the property card uh, or whichever card you're creating for your template property. In the case of OptiStruct, this is done on the PCOMP P under the Z0. And there are two typical options. 
The first is z not equal to zero, uh, which specifies that the stack begins at the element surface. This basically represents a mesh which is on the tooling geometry. The other common option is a z not equal to blank, uh, which instructs the solver to set each element equal to minus t over 2. And this is the default option. To do this in hypermesh, I'm simply going to come back into hypermesh under the template property, come down to z not, and we'll set our uh, offset such that the elements represent the tooling surface. Note that as soon as we do have thickness on these elements, uh, in other words, we've specified some sort of laminate, uh, when we go to do 3D visualization of our laminate, the offset will appear. So depending on this setting, I'll see the full cross-sectional thickness set at whatever my z naught value is. In this video, the laminate stacking direction will be set. In all supported solvers, the stacking direction is determined by the element normal. And in all these supported solvers, the element normal is determined by the node ordering on each element. In Hypermesh, we have a utility to manage that, uh, exposed in the composite browser under right-click orient element normals. And go ahead and select the elements and then specify an operation. I'll start just with a display and apply to view the current element normals. And depending on whether these are correct, consistent or not, I can choose a following operation. In this case, it does look like all of the normals are consistent, and sometimes that's easier to see with the color option. But in this example, I want my stack direction actually to go in from the tooling surface. So to accomplish this, I will flip to reverse and apply again. And if I go back to the vector option, we can see that that operation has been applied. In this video, the material reference orientation will be set. This is the vector which each nominal ply orientation references. Uh, it can be constant or spatially varying, and can be thought of as the equivalent of the zero degree fiber direction. Note this is only one of as many as three transformations, which might be applied to arrive at the final fiber orientation or ply one direction at any element. Uh, the first is this material reference orientation, which gets us from some sort of default uh, element x direction, which varies from solver to solver, to the zero degree fiber direction. The next transformation is a nominal ply orientation. So when we type a minus 45 or a 45 or a 90 uh, into our ply orientation here coming up, the vector we're setting right now is what that uh, rotation will reference. And then last, on top of the nominal ply orientation, we can optionally additionally apply a final draped fiber orientation, which takes into account any uh, variation in fiber orientation due to compound curvature. Uh, each solver does use different cards to specify this data and recommendations for shell models are provided in the solver specific section. But if we use the utility uh, shown in this video, all the appropriate cards are selected automatically. So back in Hypermesh, to access the utility, I can right click and orient material reference orientation. The methods available are specified under X and Z. And these will change a little bit by solver depending on what is allowed in terms of solver cards, but for our purposes, they're pretty consistent. And typically I'm using whatever is most convenient for my application. And that usually ends up being either a curved system or vector for the X direction. And for the Z direction, for shell elements, this will always be the element normal as described previously. But if solid elements are selected, then there are additional options available. So in our case, we'll go ahead and just assign a local system. We don't actually have one created yet, 
So I'll go ahead and create one now with the model systems tool. I'll use a node as the origin. And then I'll go ahead and rotate to the appropriate direction. So when we ultimately select this system, as defined currently, this would be a projection of this X vector onto all the elements that we select. I'll accept that system creation, come back into the reference orientation tool. I'll go ahead and select my elements. I'll specify the system method and select my system and apply. Upon apply, we'll get a visualization of the orientation we just set. And I can go ahead and close out of the tool. This video reviews common OptiStruct material cards. As of 2022.3, in general, there are two material recommendations. The first is a Mat9 ore, which is a linear orthotropic material for both 2D and 3D elements. And the second is a Mat MDS, which allows multi scale designer to be hooked uh, to OptiStruct. Mat MDS is interesting for a couple of reasons. The first is it can be used to model both single and multi scale materials for linear or nonlinear solutions. Uh, the same material defined in multi scale designer can be used directly as is for the majority of the solvers discussed in this training. And finally, it does have a large material database, which can be used to rapidly generate uh, new materials at various ply and laminate scales for a number of different constituent materials with various uh, unit cells or repeating cells and volume fractions. In addition to those two, MAT1s are the linear isotropic material, MAT9s are anisotropic, and MAT8s are for uh, 2D elements only, orthotropic, and are kept around for legacy purposes. On the right, we have some example properties for a typical unidirectional carbon epoxy part in an IPS unit system. These are just for reference. If we come back into HyperMesh, the starting point database, which we already have open, uh, has a couple MAT9 ores already in it with representative properties for a fiberglass and a carbon, both unidirectional products. This video covers ply shape creation, and we'll ultimately use these when we create our ply entities. It's not a prerequisite that the ply shapes are created before the plies, but I find it's generally easier to create ply shapes first, one ply shape per unique physical shape, and then to simply assign them when the actual plies are created. For this example, we'll create two unique ply shapes. One will be a full coverage of all the elements in the part, and the other will be a partial coverage. To create them, I'll do a right click create, come down to shape, for every solver, ply shapes are simply an element set, typically with whatever the appropriate solver card for an element set is. And I'll go ahead and activate my element collector and select all the elements for this first shape. I'll give it a name. And then moving on to the partial shape, Same thing, I can activate the collector, uh, particularly if you have geometry, but there are various other methods. Uh, if you go into the advanced selection, there's usually a convenient method to select elements here, other than shift selecting. For this example, I'll do a by surface and grab just those surfaces there and make that selection. This video reviews ply creation. In hypermesh, plies represent a material product cut from a roll, but not yet stacked in a laminate. Uh, so for a typical 
uni or woven uh, product coming off a roll. It's assigned a material or has a material. It has a nominal thickness, an assigned shape, which was defined in the previous video, and a nominal orientation in reference to our previously defined material orientation. Further, for automated processes, we're continuing to add uh, specific ply types, which represent those processes. Uh, and in these scenarios, each ply represents a typical uh, layer of coverage. So for example, uh, we have a wound type, which represents the filament winding process and manages all the spatially varying details uh, below the ply. As part of this training package, we have uh, specific slides and videos on uh, certain unique ply types. Uh, so we won't get into the details here. We'll just focus on the uh, typical standard assignments. I'll go ahead and specify all the plies shown in this image in HyperMesh. So I'll go ahead and jump back to HyperMesh here. And to create a ply, I can right click Create Ply. You see it has a product assignment, no index. I can type in an orientation, a thickness, a material. And for a shape assignment, I'll come down and select one of the previously created shapes. I can continue to create these one at a time, or I can right click on the ply and duplicate. Uh, we're creating eight total plies. I already have one, so I'll go ahead and do seven more. And for these seven, I can simply shift select or control select uh, to modify just a portion of them. So I'll do the fiberglass first. Uh, they have the correct thickness per the image. We'll make sure I get the correct material assigned. All of them have a full shape. Uh, we do have some different orientations, which I'll come in and type in directly in the orientation column. And for the carbon plies, I'll go ahead and shift select those. We already have the correct material assignment. And for these middle two, we'll specify a orientation and a different shape. So we have eight fully defined plies now. Again, they, they aren't actually on the model yet because they're not stacked, but they are fully defined. This video covers laminate creation and stacking. To create a laminate similar to the previous composite entities, it's a right click create and laminate. Go ahead and give it a name here. Uh, under laminate option, I have control over settings like symmetry, as well as stiffness options, core options, and some other uh, smear, for example, which is mainly used in uh, optimization. Usually I'm using total or symmetric. For type, for panels like this, we just want a single ply laminate defined. Uh, when we get into the complex geometry training uh, and videos, other types will be used. So I'll leave those default for now. To stack plies in a laminate, I can shift select one or more from the unstacked folder and drag and drop them into the laminate. Once they're in the laminate, the stacking sequence is fully defined. I can manipulate it with additional shift selects and drags. And I'll go ahead and make sure my stacking sequence matches the image shown on the plies and laminate slide. So that all looks correct. Uh, once my laminate is stacked, I do have the option to just do a little bit of uh, ply naming convention cleanup and color cleanup. I'll go ahead and auto color these plies first. And then if I right click the laminate, 
I can say rename plies. And for example, I'll go ahead and uh, turn off the laminate prefix. Set index as the method for ply name. Give it a prefix and give it some number of minimum digits. Go ahead and say OK. And that'll rename all my plies per their stacked index in that setting. And with the creation of the laminate, this is a fully defined ply based model now. This video reviews all common visualization options specific to composites. Uh, first up, orientations. I can look at material reference orientations in a couple ways. We'll start off with a right click orient material reference review. This allows me to select one or more elements that I want to look at material reference orientations on. I'll go ahead and select all of them. And with default settings, I can click apply. That'll plot my X, Y, and Z by default material reference on each element. I do have some additional control here on the display. Usually the vector scaling is pretty good uh, with the auto setting, but I do have the option to manually specify vector sizes. I can also control uh, which of the axes is plotted by manipulating these toggles here and applying again. To see my fiber orientations, I can select any one ply and right click. Under review orientation, I can go ply one direction. And this will plot my uh, fiber orientation on each element. If I wanted to plot my material reference on top of this, with another right click, I can go review orientations and material reference to display that as well. As I change the ply selection, you'll see the uh, vectors drawn auto update based on the selection. I can also arrow through these. And I can turn that vector plot off by again right click, review orientations, and selecting the ply one direction. For shape visualization, I can automatically see all the plies in the stack or their bounding uh, ply shape by selecting the laminate. And I get that bounding shape drawn on the part. And if I select any one or more plies uh, within the laminate or unstacked, I'll see the bounding line drawn for each of those ply shapes. Lastly, I can display a uh, thickness uh, of each element with this visualization display 2D shells as 3D. And the first option just turns on the full 3D uh, thickness visualization of each element. So this is the total assigned thickness on each element. And it also covers uh, offsets. So in one of the early videos of this tutorial, we defined that our uh, elements represented the tooling geometry with a Z naught equal to zero. I could go back to the mid plane, for example, and we see the element thickness uh, shift on the screen. If I set it back to the tooling surface, we see it shift again. I can also plot uh, either directly on the shells or on these uh, 3D visualized shells the total calculated thickness is a contour plot. I can also visualize any uh, zones of uh, constant stacking sequence within the laminate here. We just have those two zones as displayed. I'll go ahead and set this back to automatic. And in addition to the 2D detailed thickness, we can turn on ply layers. I'll make sure my uh, selection here is either prop, uh, properties or plies. That'll color everything in the color of the plies. And I do suggest with this option, if you haven't already done so, to shift select all plies, select any one of their colors and 
auto color. So again, this allows me to see all plies through thickness. I also have a link through thickness between the browser and what I have uh, or am hovering over on the screen. And this also caption or captures any, for example, ply drops and what those details look like uh, through thickness. So throughout the uh, model build, all good options, which can be used to verify that the data you're inputting uh, is going in as expected. To turn those back off, I'll just come back to my visualization here on elements and toggle both of those options off.